everyone, and welcome to the Conversations of Excellence. In today's conversation, I have a very special guest, Joe Jacoby. Joe is an Olympic gold medalist. He has served as CEO of an Olympic and Paralympic organization. He is today a peak performance coach. But you know what? He is much, much more than that. And we're going to discover more today. Joe, welcome to today's conversation. I'm so excited. Well, you are not more <laughs> excited than I am. This is going to be great. And uh, yeah, let's, let's dig in. And I, I hope somewhere in here, we actually get to tell the little story about how we actually met each other. Yes, yes. And um, I, I'm really excited for the few next minutes. But before we deep dive, I just wanted to know, is there anything that I forgot to say about Joe uh, <laughs> for an introduction? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't think this will surprise you. You know, I sort of kind of feel, you know, I turned 51 years old a few weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel in incredibly just grateful about where life is and I, I'm, I'm healthy and I'm always thinking about, you know, it, it's not uncommon. We all have these human brains we, we carry around. And, and I, so I, I suppose maybe one thing that I'm always, uh, you know, not always, I'm starting to kind of give a little bit more reflection and practice to is, um, is kind of really letting go of some of the labels. Like, and I know mm. like you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you could not search my name on Google and probably not find something that relates to being an Olympic gold medalist. Like, mm -hmm. I, I get it. I, I, I get that these kind of things sort of follow you around. But at the same time, I think it's is sort of part of the growth process. It's part of the, the development process to mm -hmm. figure out how to um, to let go just for your own health, your own goodness, mm -hmm. and sort of open up that space, you know, to, um, for whatever needs to come in or to just open up that space and let that space be. And so, you mm. know, I'm, I think you, you said it very nicely and I think it just opens up the, just gets more to the heart of the kind of, and spirit of the kind of conversation that we can have here today. Mm. Can I, I just want to bounce back on that. If there was one label to, Describe Joe in a few words. What would it be? What would you choose? Well, I, I um, <laughs> my, my, my hope is to be working towards aware, you know, is just to be more self-aware mm. um, and uh, hopefully just be better at kind of um, finding those ways to press pause with thought loops and kind of ideas and reflections about where we are. Mm. Having said that, I also think about when I hear a question like that, Stella, I also think a lot about environment and like, you know, where, where do I really want to exist and what do I want to kind of be around and, and what effect does that kind of have on, on who the person is that, mm. who the human is that, that I am. And, um, so I live in, um, I, I was born in the United States, but I live in the Spanish state of Catalonia in the Pyrenees Mountains. Uh, I live uh, very close to the French border, very close to the Principality of Andorra, about two hours to the north of Barcelona. And, um, you know, I always describe the culture and the spirit of the Catalan people who live in the Pyrenees Mountains and with these three words, uh, simple, slower, and less. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I can't say like that's me in, 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 in a nutshell or a label, but it is a really beautiful way of life that um, I experience where I live. And I'm also mindful of the world. And again, I'm not saying that other people should live that way. Mm -hmm. I'm very sensitive that everyone needs to choose like, well, it's a good way to be. There are a lot of people who want to be more productive or more efficient, or they want to double their sales, or they want to win an Olympic gold medal. They want to do more things or mm -hmm. be more things. And it's really good. But one of the things I have tried to do is to think about simple, slower, and less 
if it's not a way to live for everyone and it's not, you know, can it still be like a reflecting, can it be like a lens of reflection or, or even a mindset so that even if you want to produce more things or do more things, are there elements of simple, slower and less that are going to be helpful to you in that process? And, and at this stage of my life, I mean, I can confidently say yes, that I think even if you want to double sales, like it, it can help you to, if you want to sell more of, of something is just an example, just if you mm-hmm. want to sell more is that um, if you take the word simple, slower and less, you know, if you simplify, you kind of identify what's more, the most important, less, you kind of push away what you don't need and slower. I think any time that you sort of slow down, you maybe instead of focusing on three or four tasks at one time, you focus on just one task or mm. maybe you take one element of a sales call and instead of like jumping right to the sale you know you you take time to really focus on the person that that's in front of you Mm -hmm. so um when i think even about that that question about what describes joe um that's big big work in progress i hope more aware but i also then i kind of transfer that question a little bit also into sort of the culture and environment Mm -hmm. with, with which i like to exist which is where I live here in Catalonia and that idea of simple, slower, and less. Mm. Simple, slower, and less. I would like, like to focus on the word slower. And okay. I remember the first time I met you, I was fascinated because we were in a context where we could align two words in one single sentence, the words slow and the words performance. Right. And that brings me to my question, which is, with your experience, what do you see is the greatest myth around performance? Uh, boy, where, where to start on that one? Well, <laughs> let's kind of, I mean, let's, um, maybe an interesting way is just to sort of pick up on the word slow and performance and kind mm. of look at the antithesis and sort of performing fast, you know, and Mm -hmm. let's, you know, I, I know that you, you are a fan of the Olympic games. I know that you are a fan of, of elite athlete, high level performance and not, not all sport. The goal is to go fast, but let's just, let's just look at events that do Mm -hmm. kind of have an emphasis on speed, say like Mm -hmm. swimming or, um, uh, track and, uh, you know, the, uh, the running, the sprinting events in, in athletics, Mm -hmm canoeing, rowing. Okay. It's an element of speed Mm -hmm. and it could be very easy to sort of say, okay, I want to be really good at these, at these activities, at these sport, at this sport. And so, um, to be fast, I have to run fast a lot, Mm -hmm. or I have to row fast a lot or paddle fast a lot. And I don't want to say that that's not true. I mean, there is some work that it needs to be done at a high speed, but Mm -hmm. When you learn how to run going super slow, when you learn how to paddle going super slow, that you can really break down the technique of mechanics, uh, connective tissues, body movements, and you can feel it in a way in a more controlled environment. Like when you're really doing something fast, it's almost like you're not even thinking about all the little small details. My challenge to people is like, how can you slow down enough to think about how the technique of the activity works so that you can really break that down and practice it so that when you get into a situation that requires you to go fast or, you know, you're kind of being chased by the proverbial tiger Mm -hmm. and you have to move fast, that you've actually trained your body to do it in a slow way so that its ability to work the body work together in a fast way, actually the chances that that happens successfully improves. And so I think it's a little bit of a, uh, we always think that we have to practice to perform better, that we have to practice doing more, going harder, always expanding the limits. And what I would actually say just in a general myth is, Mm -hmm. but really important to understand that 
generally like as humans, we have like a race pace, like a pace that we perform really well at, at doing. And, and it's natural to want to move our race pace up over time. But mm-hmm. the way we go from here to here, in the way we kind of go from uh, one step to a higher step, it's not to just train at race pace or even to train above race pace. We need some um, like little spurts, like little moments where mm-hmm. we activate our, our bodies, our, our performance at a more intense level. And we do work at l- slower than race pace where we really give the body a chance to slow down, to rest, to recover, mm-hmm. uh, to kind of put ourselves back, back, back together. It's not unlike the, um, the philosophy of what happens when you go into a gym and lift a weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, you break the muscle down and then the real getting stronger part is giving the muscle a chance to repair so that it kind of comes back together stronger than it was be, be, before. Mm-hmm. So I, it's not just doing more and going harder. Like those are fun words to say to each other, like, yeah, let's go big, let's go harder, let's do more. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I've, I'm always kind of looking the other way and saying, well, um, what does is, what is your rest look like? You know, what does your recovery look like? Um, where are you taking time for yourself um, to just sort of, you know, put the, let the pieces kind of come back together and ultimately like not just expend energy, but how you mm-hmm. replenish energy. And mm-hmm. I just think that, that we overlook that. Most people overlook that so, so much. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Joe. I, I think it brings me to my next question. You know, we're currently in a moment in history mm. with this COVID crisis where I think I have the feeling, my personal experience, that many people see it as they have been forced to slow down and to ask themselves questions in different areas. For you, the way you experience this moment, what is the greatest, I mean, maybe the most significant, I don't want to say lesson, but I'll, I'll just use that word. What is the most significant lesson that this moment of history has brought to you so far? That's a good question. A lot of answers kind of come forward at once, but if maybe just sort of jumping back to the, mm. um, to the first main quarantine that we had here in the country of Spain, mm. which started in mid-March. And um, just for context, um, Spain's quarantine was really, really strict. So, mm. We, uh, in most countries that had quarantines and, and um, you know, where people were kind of staying at home, uh, a lot of countries like France, for example, they had provisions for people to go out and do some exercise alone, safely. Um, mm-hmm. You could, you know, a certain amount of time per day or within a certain distance from your house. In Spain, that was not the case. Like your only permissible reason for leaving your house was to go to the supermarket uh, to go to the pharmacy or urgent care, unless you had a special job that, re- you know, allowed, required you to leave the house, to, you know, to, to work. And so, yeah, that, that quarantine um, was, was really, it was really restrictive. And, uh, you know, you could really kind of feel the, it, there were just so many things that didn't make sense. You know, I mean, I, I, I understood the premise of the quarantine, but then there's also a part of me that says, you know, it, the, the public health mindset, you know, that I have says like, mm-hmm. gosh, you know, figuring out a way for people to exercise alone and, and safely and close to their house outdoors, you know, and in a responsible way would just seem to kind of make people's body, mind and spirit stronger and and be able to be in a better position to you know resist and deflect um disease i'm not a doctor but it just kind of seems you know that that Mm -hmm. way but i think that the quarantine um did kind of help us to um uh not to think about what we can control about 
what comes into the world, like these big changes that do affect the world. But, but COVID and the pandemic reminds us in a huge, huge way this, that we do get to choose how we respond. Hmm. And, I, and that, that comes from a lesson I learned from my sports psychologist during the last four years of my athletic career, uh, Dr. Megan Nyer, who was an Olympian in, in, in diving. And Megan, Dr. Megan would always say, um, it's not about what happens, it's about how you choose your response to what happens. Mm -hmm. And that just, you know, before COVID, it would have been so easy to, for people to say, yeah, 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 that, that, that sounds good. But COVID really kind of forced people to kind of um, reckon with that, with those words that you have a choice of how you choose to respond. Mm -hmm. It's not about positivity or optimism, but it just means that you have a choice of how you respond and it's not right or wrong, but in, it, it's a very hard thing. And, and that's not to, I'm not talking about, you know, how challenging this particular disease was and, yeah. you know, and, and how um, it disproportionately affected uh, uh, different groups of people, different societies, different classes of, of people, you know, here in Spain, uh, for sure, there were, for example, there were you know, much poorer neighborhoods in Madrid that were much more affected than wealthier neighborhoods. Mm. I, I, all those things, you know, uh, taken into consideration is that the only way that we can put ourselves in a position to do better, it's not to just control the events that really we can't control, but is to choose our response to mm. the events that we can't control. Okay. Wow. Choice, right? Um, the fundamental place that choice has. Um, it, it brings me to another question about actually the choices that mm. you had to do over the last years to be where you are today. Uh, yeah. Right. What has been, if, if you can maybe share with us, maybe one important, I don't know, event or something which happened which you think was really fundamental yeah. for you being where you are today. So, and I, I love this question and, and I, I, I do have an answer and, and uh, let me give a little context about where yes. I am today so yeah. then I can back up to that. Mm. So um, I'm at a point today where I've made this quality of life mm. move adventure to the, to Catalonia, to La Seo and, uh, I, I live in a culture where I'm learning to speak a different language and just my, my brain is active and firing and learning all, all the time. <laughs> and I see you love I'm, it. <laughs> I'm, I'm healthy. I, I, I run five or six days a week. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I, I, I have good, good, good people in my life. Mm. I, I'm fortunate. And okay. It wasn't so long ago that it wasn't that way uh, for me. Um, but I think it would be very easy for people to look at my life and, and say, well, gosh, how did you put yourself on the airplane to go move to another country? Or how did you, you know, and run marathons and launch a coaching business? And it's so easy to see that the exciting part, the exciting jumps and the exciting steps. Mm. But the reality was, is that in 20. 12, you know, or late 2011, I was, um, you know, I weighed more than 30 pounds heavier. I was 30 pounds heavier than I am now. I was in a job that I was performing, uh, that was the chief executive officer of an Olympic sport organization in the US, in which at the time I was performing poorly in my job. I was stressed out to the gills. Um, I wasn't managing pressure that I brought on to myself very, very well. And again, it was just, you know, it's like, where do you start? Where, where do you begin? So my answer to your question is, is that in early 2012, so I, at the time I was based in Oklahoma City, I was the chief executive officer of USA Canoe Kayak. I was overweight and having all these challenges, but I, USA Canoe Kayak was 
um, the governing, the national governing body for the sport of canoeing in the United States was headquartered in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation and the Oklahoma City Boathouse District, which is this very futuristic mm -hmm. boathouse district that's not just for elite rowers and kayak athletes, but is just an incredible resource for public health and in the and you know exposing people to the outdoors and outdoor adventure in a very urban area. Mm -hmm. And I got to be a part of building that out through my involvement of USA Canoe Kayak, but the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation started an employee wellness program in January of 2012, right after the, the, the Christmas holidays. And um, I started to do that. And um, I didn't have a goal. I was just trying to kind of break bad patterns. And basically the bad patterns for me was like, every day at lunch, going to the all-you-can-eat Chinese food buffet or the all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. Mm -hmm. And I joined this wellness program. So I was just playing games and having fun with my, uh, with my colleagues at work. And uh, so I replaced going to the all-you-can-eat food buffet with um, you know, a workout and doing exercise and having fun with my friends. So what I would tell you that was just this really kind of unseen step was not even choosing to do the wellness program on going to the gym on day one. Mm -hmm. But what I always tell people, the most important day for me in this whole journey was going back to the gym on day two. You know, mm -hmm. I'd, going the first day and trying it out was easy. But coming back and doing day two, like that was it. Like that to me, and it's like, there's no photos on Instagram. There's no great stories to tell. You didn't, you haven't lost any weight. You haven't made your life really any better. Mm. But all you're doing is like, you're signifying to your brain, to your heart, to your, to your soul, that there's something, there's an important seed that you're planting here that's worth doing. And what I can tell you is that by in, kind of seeing that through and continuing to go to the gym, that that's where the whole mantra, my mantra, small steps forward every day came about. Mm. And, you know, yeah, I started to feel better and I started to um, get in better shape. And then I started to kind of ask myself, okay, I'm physically doing better, but how can I do better mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? And this took years, but eventually step by step by step by step, it led to some bigger things that didn't, you know, quitting my job as a CEO in the Olympic movement, it seemed like a big deal to other people who weren't working, you know, who didn't, who weren't in my shoes, but it was an easy decision because it was just like the next small step to make. Mm. Just like moving to Catalonia was, it was not a big step to leave the United States, States. It was just the next small step to make. And so that's my answer is it was going back to the gym on day two when I was just, my life was it so close to bottomed out, it, like it had bottomed out and I was just on the first or second step away from the bottom. And I think trying to find that momentum and the reason to go forward and the reason to continue and just that belief that, you know, you'll be better because you have no results to show for it at that point. No, not on day two. <laughs> There's nothing there on day two. Mm. But I think day one is pretty easy. You know, it's like, ah, come on, Stella, what could it hurt to try day one? Like, yeah, then, all the, <laughs> then, then it's done. Then like, yeah. it, it's like, you know, nothing against, you know, Tony Robbins per se, but my big, my big issue with putting 10,000 people in an arena and getting them all hyped up and they're feeling great and they feel like they can take on these big goals and hey, that's wonderful. And for some, they will. But for many who walk out of a, an arena like that or an event like that, they get home and they have to do day two and the support system isn't there. The accountability system isn't there. And they've just kind of ramped up, you know, being in this exciting environment for a few days. And now they're home and it's like, Mm. now why you know and so i'm just trying to find like think about alternative ways that people can sort of um reach their future desired states 
that are based more on patience, that are based more on really small incremental steps and just figuring out what are the tiny muscles that you can exercise on a daily basis that don't really seem like very much at the time, but when you repeat using that muscle day after day after day, mm -hmm. it makes what looks like a big decision to others just feel very like a really small decision for yourself. Mm. Wow, I love it. I really love it. Um, you talked about excitement and I want it, to, it made me think about that great story you told me about for your medal. Uh, <laughs> the stolen medal. The stolen medal. And I loved the way it ended. I invite the people who are listening to us. There's a great video that I watched about it, which describes everything which happened around the stolen medal, but it has a beautiful ending. And what I love about that ending is really the time you took, Joe, to meet that person and create an additional experience with that person, right? Um, what was for you during the experience of the stolen medal, your greatest insight? Um, I think there were two insights about the stolen medal. So just for context, in... Uh, 20 in, two, in 2016, uh, just a few months prior to the Olympic Games in Rio, a, um, I was in Atlanta and a thief uh, broke into my car uh, mm. and uh, grabbed my computer bag, which had my, uh, my 1992 Olympic gold medal in it. And so the story became quite a big story. The Olympic news cycle was a little bit slow. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Um, what I can tell you about that is that, I mean, one thing was it just that something I already had in place was that um, the medal doesn't de define me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, not having the medal in my possession, like that was okay. I mean, the only reason I had the medal in my possession at the time, I got asked that all the time, like, why did you have the metal with you? Like, why don't you keep it in a safety deposit box? Or why don't you keep it someplace safe? And I'm like, and I just said, well, people can't touch it and hold it and wear it if it's in a safety deposit box. I mean, I have it with me so that people can interact with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's, you know, I had been doing some media work in Atlanta that day. And so I, I had it with me for that reason. And I, I knew ahead of time that that meant that I lost the metal because I was sharing it. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And then the second, very related to it, is that in finding it, that you just realize that he's not my man. Like I said many times, like if I could take a hammer and smash the metal into a million pieces, <laughs> there wouldn't be enough pieces to give to everyone who has like ownership in that metal. Mm, and so, um, so it really, you know, it, it doesn't define me and it doesn't like really belong to me. And, and so, uh, I'm, I'm really, I mean, I enjoy the experience of winning it so much and the relationship with my canoeing partner, Scott, and then, you know, it, it, um, it continues to have a, a story of its own today. But then I think that does lead into sort of how the medal was found. And you were alluding to Chloe Smith that was six years old when she found the medal and then seven when I met her mm. a few weeks later. But I would also say that um, it, it is, I mean, Chloe is wonderful, but uh, um, her mom, Sh Charlemagne, is an amazing woman. And she has absolutely been like a glue that has kind of held, you know, this friendship together. And Chloe's father, Wayne, is, is a wonderful man. And so we've been out on the Chattahoochee River together you know the the the, the smith family um uh, was have been out before and then chloe and i uh were out on the river again when we um we filmed a uh, a piece for um the, for cbs news mm -hmm. and so we've done a little bit of, of paddling together now i follow chloe on instagram and it it almost hurts because she's growing up so much <laughs> <laughs> she's been four years and you know she's so much bigger and uh um but it's great you know it's it's a you know she did a wonderful thing and her mom did a wonderful thing and uh um 
that's like again it's like yeah i mean it 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 sucks that a thief broke into the car and stole the metal but there's this family out there that I don't get to see very much, but I think about often and I think about Charlemagne and Wayne and wow. just they're made, they're beautiful people. And it's just, you know, it's just the, the world, the universe kind of brings us together in ways that we yeah. never could have imagined in a million <laughs> years. <laughs> I, I love, I absolutely love that story. I really invite the people who are watching to, to just, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. I had to mention that. And thank you for sharing that, uh, Joe. I loved when you talked about the different pieces of the medal. One million yeah. wouldn't be enough. It's beautiful. I really right? love it. I mean, I think yeah. you can say this about any, you know, a, a accomplishment like that. I mean, there are, sh we, we live in a world, you know, if you would just step back and we kind of speak really, really globally for a moment here and you know, we kind of transcend all the different places that we're from and the religions that we, um, we believe in and, and look to for guidance. There's always, you know, some fundamental com commonality. We, everyone wants to, you know, take, you know, take care of and respect the, you know, the senior members of a community. And we, we want to educate the younger ones well. We want to bring them up well. And, and so I think that global idea just um, kind of puts a little bit of context on that we kind of allow a much larger community to sort of put, um, figuratively put their hands um, and put their hands on our young people in a way that really, um, in the spirit of education and growth and learning and development, mm -hmm. that it, it takes a lot of people and a lot of different perspective and a lot of different situations and backgrounds, you know, to, um, you know, to sort of shape perspective of our young people that they can grow up and into and ultimately serve the world a little bit better. And ultimately even circling back to your question about COVID, not to prevent necessarily COVID from happening, but from responding better to the big events that come and affect, affect the world the, the way it does. So yeah, I mean, in the American culture, we have school teachers and coaches and piano instructors and you know, family and friends, all these people that, you know, summer camps and that have an effect on, you know, who the people are we become. And, and they all have, like, for me, all those people have a, you know, have ownership in that Olympic medal. Like, mm. it's like, you know, this like little butterfly effect. If one little piece changes, like maybe that doesn't happen. Mm. Maybe doesn't happen the, the way it does so then you could just have to sort of go back through time and history and just acknowledge mm -hmm. that everything had a touch on it from you know the preschool and the nursery school teachers and people who like kind of made you feel good and comfortable with a cup of hot apple cider on a cold winter day <laughs> To, you know, a, um, you know, maybe to like a, a nurse in an operating room when I was having my first hernia operation that just was, mm. you know, trying to just make you feel a little bit better about what you were about to undergo. I mean, you just go on and on and say like, yeah, everyone has a little piece of that medal. Wow. I love this acknowledgement you're, you're giving, Joe. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love it. And the fact that you talked about the younger generation and all these people who were involved in your uh, while you were young, it's really perfect because it brings me to one of our last questions. And I love to mm. ask that question is, if you had your younger self, let's say of 10 years old in yeah. front of you, what would you whisper to him? Uh, I'm so glad that you actually said 10 years old. I, I, I use this example a lot wow. you know, when, when talking to, to people because um, pay attention to what you love at 10 years old. And, you know, it, it is just, it is one of, I, I think that between like 10, for, 
I think especially for, for boys, I, I, I can't say based on experience for girls, but I think that age between 10 and 15 years old, I think what you really love, you know, is, is a great way when you're in your 40s, 50s and 60s and, you know, you're kind of thinking about passion and purpose. I like to say, like, what, what excited you when you were 10? Mm. And so what I can tell you for me about that and how it translated was um, I loved watching sports on TV. I actually loved listening to uh, good baseball on the radio, good mm -hmm. baseball commentary on the radio. You know, I was like, oh, the people who can make this interesting and can tell stories, like that's what I figured out about it. It wasn't like that they could call a baseball game really good. They were, it wasn't anything to do with announcing a baseball game. They were good at telling stories. Huh. And so what I sort of see that I figured out that I've done many, many years later, you know, 41 years later to the date of your question, is that um, whether it's through Sunday Morning Joe or through uh -huh. my coaching, is that um, I figured out, like I thought I wanted to be um, a baseball announcer on the radio. But in the end, I think what I figured out was that I just wanted to figure out um, a better way uh, to share stories and to tell stories. And that's, I think the answer is, is that about 10 years old, so this, I would say this to either a parent of a 10 year old or a, listening to this podcast, the coach of a 10 year old listening to this, or even a 10 year old listening to this. <laughs> Pay attention to what, you know, what the 10 year old likes right now, because it is a great, great snapshot of life to come back to um, much, much later on. And that acknowledges that even whether your kind of your 10 year old existence sort of feels mm -hmm. like pretty safe and secure, or it actually feels really challenged and uncertain, we still kind of reserve a place in our our brains i think at that age that mm -hmm. allows us you know for the the picture of something better as something that we would really enjoy something that we would really kind of make us feel more safe and secure about the world if we're not in that situation itself so there again even you know, at this stage of much later in life, we we all come down the line with different backgrounds, and we have different. We are we come from different families, so we just sort of arrive in this world where we are today. Kind of, we're all playing like a different game, and that that makes sense because we've come from different experiences and backgrounds. So, but even if they've been hard backgrounds, that maybe what I would say about being ten years old is that try to think about what made you feel good or safe or secure? What were you thinking about at 10? And what was it about that that you were really going after? And then might that be something worth uh, pursuing a little bit more deeply or at least reflecting mm -hmm. upon uh, today? Mm -hmm. Wow, 10 years old. But you know, as you were talking, I was myself like, ah! pay attention to what you love oh boy so it's really let beautiful me you, let me ask you what, what 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 about you at 10 years old what did you well, like what do you think you know what i liked is totally related to what we're doing today that's what is really funny of i course. loved watching precisely i loved watching i used to live in maryland with my parents for a few years and i remember i think i was about eight years old nine nine-ish and I love to watch the Oprah Winfrey show I love the way she connected to people just here listening to their stories and and I, I I was thinking about this as you were saying it I was like oh yeah what am I doing now with Joe so yeah <laughs> one of by the way I mean in in I mean just historically speaking I mean what an incredible her ability, Oprah's ability to bring, not only to tell a good story, but to bring out the real story in someone else. I mean, it's just off the chart, you know, mm -hmm. world-class, like, you know, how mm -hmm. good she is at that. And let me just sort of tie a little, I mean, 
I, I can't believe I'm doing this, but uh, <laughs> a little Maryland triangle. You know, Oprah got her start at a news station in Baltimore. Uh, really? I was born in, I was born in, I wasn't born in, in Maryland, but I was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Bethesda, Maryland. Oh, really? So what, what, <laughs> state, what, what city in Maryland did you live in? I think it was, um, I think I used to go to school to Bethesda in the French, was it in Bethesda? But you know, these, these cities, these words are familiar. Yeah, yeah. And I think we lived in, was it Rockville? Does it make sense? Yes. I, yeah. So <laughs> this is amazing. You and I, like we lived just a few minutes apart from each we did, other. We did, we did. This is amazing. <laughs> my, listen, my, my, my father, uh, who passed away a few months ago, he used to take us to play putt-putt golf, mini golf at the little putt-putt golf in Rockville. No ways. Yeah, right. So we, uh, we crossed each other and I was... <laughs> how great, how, how, how great. Well, that'll be a great <laughs> offline conversation for us to yes, have. Yes, we will definitely have an offline conversation. I love this. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, you know, you talked about stories and telling stories which was something that you loved since you were a younger age and one of the ways it translated into was the Sunday morning with Joe is it yeah Sunday right? morning Joe yes St Sunday morning Joe sorry and I absolutely love that this is something that people who are listening need to check out and my next question is if we want to know more about your work is there any other way that people can reach you yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, I, I've been writing Sunday morning. So Sunday Morning Joe is a weekly uh, newsletter that I mm -hmm. write out. And, you know, I think people probably hear that and they initially roll their eyes. And, it, you know, it really It's wonderful, by the way. It is phenomenal. Okay, I'm just... Yeah, <laughs> look, you know, this is when I left my job as chief executive officer of USA Canoe Kayak, uh, I, I left on a Friday afternoon and I wrote, I, I wrote an email that I sent out on Sunday morning, that next Sunday morning to a few friends, mm -hmm. just kind of saying, Hey, here's where I am in life. And mm. can we keep in touch? And I sent it to, that email to five people. This was no, November 16th, 2014. And every one of them wrote back and said, this is great. You know, keep in touch, send something again next week. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so I wrote another email the next week and sent it on Sunday and sent it to the same five people. And they said, have you thought about maybe making this a little bit more public? And after oh, wow. that, I just, Sunday morning, Joe, is I write about, um, you know, improving performance, um, mm -hmm. overcoming uh, obstacles and aligning with uh, purpose. And I just sort of, write what I think I need to say to myself. And I then share that with others. And um, I don't advertise it very much. And uh, it's not business development. It's just, uh, uh, I, I just write. And mm -hmm. I take last two years, I've taken the summer off, but now I'm writing again. And uh, it's, I, I, I love it. And like, when I went to the gym on day two, um, I just sort of feel like I'm writing for the, for the long game here. You know, I doesn't really have like an end game to it, but you know, I hope it's something that I'm still doing a long time from now. I, I enjoy doing it. And, uh, and then of course, when you decide to publish it, uh, you know, my email, it comes from me, my personal email address. So if you just hit reply, you, and say hello, or you ask a question about, or you give it, I respond to everyone. Like I don't, I don't have an assistant or uh, someone that helps me. I do it all myself. And so it opens up a lot of wonderful conversations on Sunday for me as well, which, mm. which I look forward to as well. So um, yeah, it's great. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoy it. But uh, you people can go to joejacobi.com, J-O-E, J A C O B I dot com. And from there, there's only two things you can do on that, uh, on that page. You can either learn more about five with Joe coaching, or you can sign up for Sunday morning, Joe. And I encourage you to sign up for Sunday morning, Joe. And, uh, that's it. It's, um, 
it's that easy. And, uh, and if you're on LinkedIn or on Twitter, yeah, come say hello. But other than that, Sunday morning Joe is a great way to talk. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. I really, I mean, I don't know for you, but this, it was enjoyable for me personally. And I know oh. that the people who are listening, it is <laughs> enjoyable. How was it for you, by the way? <laughs> so, I absolutely lo loved it. You know, I, I'm always hopeful that these conversations are helpful to other people. Yes. But I think that, you know, I think even when, when I'd read that you had started this initiative to do these conversations of excellence, I, I knew that the best part was that you get the opportunity to speak with people that you're excited to speak with. And the mm -hmm. fact that I'm one of those people makes me feel great. <laughs> And the way you and I met, this is such a nice way to kind of extend and grow our friendship, which is all, which is what really matters to me. Mm. And I think that I do think in the world that we live in today, where there are a lot of podcasts, there are a lot of videos and a lot of conversations and people are so often looking for what are the things that can help me? And, and I understand that, but I think what we don't hear enough on those in these kind of conversations are just two people who genuinely enjoy talking to each other, just enjoy connecting with each other. And that's why I, I do this. That's why I was looking forward to this one because we enjoy doing that. It was clear to me when we talked on the Airbnb tour and uh, here we are doing it again. And, and I, I, I hope one day there'll be, uh, well, we can have our own conversations anytime we want, but if we want to do a, an episode two sometime, let's do it. Oh, awesome. With great pleasure. Thank you so much, Joe. It is, it was phenomenal. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, why not a second version? Who knows? <laughs> I, I, All right, I'm Joe. Forward. Well, bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you so, so much. <laughs> bye. As we say here in Catalonia, adeo. <laughs> adeo.